with nonchalance, taking culture apart one episode at a time. A social commentary podcast on pop culture, fashion, film, and music. Hello, welcome to this week's podcast. This week is a two-parter that we recorded up on the rooftop and we continue to discuss fashion and mental health. I, we got up to last week. Uh, I did meet up with a childhood friend that visited London. I went to school with her from third grade, from moving to Mex- from Mexico to California, all the way to towards the end of seventh grade. And I haven't seen any of those friends since I left California. So uh, I really didn't know what kind of person we were gonna see, and so. We, we didn't meet up at a pub, and uh, it turned out really into a really good conversation, and just catching up with everything that she's been doing, and everything that everybody else did once I left. Wait, so how did she get a hold of you? Where'd she you just reached out through Instagram. She oh, said, okay. she sent a message saying, you live in London, right? And yeah, so I we started talking that way she followed me but we never really talked and um, she's friends with Vero which is my oldest friend from she went to school in the private Catholic school I went to back in Mexico and then we both moved to California and we were in the same class so she's friends with Vero and I'm we're all friends basically and how old are you when you knew that? well from 8 to 13 so yeah, like uh, middle school and elementary. Uh, for Has the she state. changed a lot, or have you have you changed a lot? Did she say anything? Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, we've all changed. It's been like so long. <laughs> it's been really long, but is she what you expected? I didn't know what to expect. Uh, so it was a good surprise uh, because at first we were like, oh, let's go have tea at John Lewis and do that. And then we missed her because of scheduling stuff. And so finally, towards the end of the week, um, I was still trying to get them to go to John Lewis. But she, she and she was asking me about like nightclubs and like, oh, are, are you here in London to go to those kind of things and I don't know if we're like partying mood or whatever so it it started feeling uneasy and then we were walking home that night and we passed by uh, the Shakespeare's head in Carnaby and it I mean pubs are crazy at night but that one wasn't so because it was like a Friday night or something wasn't it yeah when we met her it was a Friday night and you can imagine London Friday night pubs bursting yeah full of people yeah so I mean even that it was oh maybe Friday will be busy but fine we'll deal with it so we said the pub 9 p.m. or whatever and we met them there and the pub was nice we found the table it was like the, there weren't a lot of people upstairs no so yeah. oh that's uh, good that's looking good were people outside was it warm that night the, yeah there were people outside yeah, there but was it wasn't like spilling out. sometimes there's people just you can't even move yeah yeah and a lot, of, a lot of a lot of the experiences for that reason we've had is we just don't go to the pubs at night because it's so packed so middle of the day we'll go um but we we met her up at that pub and we talked for like three and a half hours or something like that and um, it was just interesting seeing the kind of person that because it's very familiar she's a mexican family as me the same kind of backgrounds and growing up and wanting to get away so she had that push and pull from the small town, uh, wanting to leave, but also like, it's so close knit in Mexican families that, and it's large families, like, I think she has like seven siblings or something like that. I, I have wow. six, so there's a lot of people. <laughs> so, and she's really close to her, her sisters and brothers. Um, so she's, she moved out of the town, but there was a lot of like back and forth. And I just, at 17, I was like, bye, I'm, I'm going to go to college now. <laughs> so, yeah, but it was interesting seeing what she's done and uh, where she's at. And it was their first time in London and they were going to Paris. And oh, nice. Were so, they enjoying it? Did they enjoy London? Yeah, they were here a week. Oh. And um, she didn't know 
that oh maybe it's too too much time to be in London but she said she really loved it she was really surprised by the town and she wants to come back and oh, good. all that good stuff so she yeah they did a lot of the touristy stuff and I gave them some tips on some things to go and do and to... oh we should explain that we're up on the roof like we're in the middle of central London up on the roof of our flat that's why you can yeah. hear like the traffic noises and... yeah so there might be sirens or motorbikes but it's a really nice night out it's lovely tonight yeah nice breeze it's like a clear sky there's a breeze and see it's about 8.30 so. yeah so it's it's perfect um last few days of summer <laughs> taking that in so yeah I met up with uh, those friends and then uh, towards the end they, they brought up Gentleman Jack because they were going to Halifax it's like oh uh, why are you going to the Halifax it, it, it hadn't clicked to me because I had just finished Gentleman Jack and yeah, I, explain I, what Gentleman Jack is it's a turn of the century, I think 18th century um, lesbian that was the head of her household and she managed everything and for that time for women to do that and There's out of the very, yeah, that just wasn't something that happened and so she managed the household and the business, the mining stuff, she, she picked that up and but she was a lesbian and she had kept these diaries and um, wrote in, the, in code that's what I Everything. was hearing about, is the coding that she did yeah. within these diaries so that if people wouldn't understand, like, literally... That she was writing about her, her love life. So it's all been decoded, all of her... Yeah, it, it was decoded, and, and people are just so... I mean, this record, to exist, this really detailed record of the life, I think it's the first uh, as fleshed out recording of a lesbian from that time. And um, yeah, so she and she dressed like a man. <laughs> That's another thing. So she dressed and and all of that. So it was. I mean, she was in in a place where she she could do that um, financially wise. Uh, so all, so I she's mean, pretty independent. Yeah, and and she managed. I don't know if you watch the series on the BBC. It's you you'll get a good sense of what she did but she she managed the money and took risks and all of that and and really she was really smart she's really smart um, in how she went about things so it was just by chance that your friend had seen this and they had built in a visit to Halifax yeah they they just recently saw it and they booked the trip like when they arrived so in the in London so Halifax is where yeah, it's where her, her home is, and they actually film at her home. Um, so the, if you watch the show, everything is filmed there. So it looks really nice, and it's the kind of countryside, British countryside, that I want to see. I know Halifax has, like, the high street and all that, the same copy of every small British town, but that's kind of like the, the dirt roads and the stone fences and all of that. We haven't seen any of that side no. UK. Oh, we haven't. haven't? No, we haven't seen anything like that. Do you need a car? You do. You need a car to kind of, you know, start kind of navigating the countryside and taking it all in. Yeah. Do you like the countryside? Yeah, too? yeah, yeah. Yeah, of course. Especially, like, in Nottingham, there's Newstead Abbey. Yeah. I think you'd really like that. Oh, okay. um, one of the poets... Oh, gosh, I can't remember his name at the moment. It'll come to me. Yeah. But, um, Baron? Oh. No, I don't, don't know. Okay, I've... well, he's like a famous poet. Yeah. And like in the 19th century, he was like crazy, and, mm -hmm. and he also knew Shelley. Oh, there might have been Byron. Frank Byron, yeah. yeah. But it's his yeah. house, and you've got, and they were like knew each other. Oh, okay. Shelley, oh. the one who wrote Frankenstein. Yeah. So yeah, that's yeah. a great. There were some crazy writers. They <laughs> were. They were. The stuff they got up to was crazy. So. Yeah. Oh, uh -huh, okay. that's interesting. In yes. one of the visits, we have to. Yeah, New Sudan. Do that. Like it. How accessible is it from where we were when we visited? From my, last um, time? it's not far. It's like forty-five minutes. Yeah. Oh, so it's like a little road trip. Yeah, it's not too okay. far, okay. but it's on the outskirts of Nottingham. Okay. Yeah. 
Okay, yeah. There's loads of places like that in Nottingham, please. Derbyshire, Newark, I mean, I could go on. Yeah. Yeah, you could explore. Okay. Okay. Let's do that. We have to do <laughs> it. Idea, we have yeah. to do it. Yeah. Um, okay, so I should just spun a bit. So, yeah, so that, that happened, and then, um... I don't know, um... Uh, we've been dealing with all the internet stuff oh, at our yes. building, and we finally got that up, but that's a over a three-day thing. Uh, we're still begging people to bring um, fiber cables into our building because we're central London, but one street will have it and another one won't. So what's happened? To to your, your whole of your broadband's gone down? Yeah, they just building. cut the cable, and apparently uh, builders do that very often. <laughs> yeah, we found out about a hotel that just did it recently. Yeah. They were putting in a fountain yeah. and they just happened to cut the cables that all of the broadband and everything for the building. No the way. Or that they, they did it in a fountain. A, a bank? I think Hal Halifax Bank? You're joking. That's Here, really Right bad. in Oxford Street. That's really bad. <laughs> but they did it twice. They did it once and then like a week later they fixed it they and a week it. later they did it again. They did what? it again. I it's just insane. That is crazy because and now it's you the You need the internet. Everything. <laughs> He was saying that some some of the homes that they go to, you can't even use the water without really? internet. So if your connection Everything goes down, to wi -Fi you're so out. So the, he was like, they're surviving on the lights that stayed on. Oh my god, <laughs> our lights that we have in our room are controlled yeah. by Wi-Fi. Right. And they're smart lights. When you take away the Wi-Fi, you never know what they're going to do. So they come on at 1.30 in the morning. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they just randomly shut off. It was. It's just been so chaotic and disorganized. Like, yeah, the music won't play. The HomePod doesn't play. And like, we never know how we're going to watch television because Netflix won't oh, play. No. Like, Lights are coming on and off at weird times. It's just been like chaotic, a chaotic three past three. Well, it's been almost two weeks now that it's been like this. Yeah. It's been three days of repairs, but two weeks. But it's been waiting, waiting and waiting, and so just making things work. So you got it all. So it's all up and running. Yeah. Well, it's up and running, and so that's hopefully gonna stay that way, and. Yeah, it's just some of the quick things. Um, we finished Euphoria, which was a good, oh, yeah, we mentioned that really show. good show. With, I started to like it more. We can talk about it more in depth. In yeah, time, we can talk about it later. Um, it just all the insanity that's happening around the world, especially in the U.S. The insanity with immigration and all of. Uh, the things that are happening to the ice raids to children being left on the streets and I mean it's really really emotional and it's not I think people are just getting so desensitized with oh well that's crazy that happened but then like you move on and you read about this and, and you move on and and it's so cruel really it's just the, the way that things are being done is strategically cruel yeah. to not there are ways that think that these things can be done if they're going to happen where children will be safe uh, but instead children are getting put in cages they're getting left uh, in parking lots uh, or can be picked up on their first day of school because their parents were taken away like you yeah. know all of that it, like, it's terrible and to think that if you're not going to look after the children in our society, then where does that The most this? innocent of the most society. Innocent. Yeah. These are like lifetimes that are being impacted by what's happening to them right now. That's forever. It's it's exactly. there. That's it's forever on their there. It's forever to have that kind of split from their parents. And the or kind to be put in a yeah. cage. I mean, the kind of person that they will become is colored by that. But you know, and it, unfortunately, it doesn't stop with them. It's, I mean, when you, when I speak to my family, and they're living in Texas and they have political opinions all across the board, all across the spectrum, there's this tone of being shell-shocked about what's happening. And so, and I mean, it's not even happening in their neighborhoods, but, you know, gun control, gun violence, and this issues of immigration. 
It doesn't stop with the, the kid who's been put into a cage. It's like your friend, that happens to your friend, that's like another echo of the trauma. That happens to someone in your classroom. You may not even be friends, but to know that that kind of thing can happen to someone that you see every day. Like that, that, someone who just lives down the street. And I mean, or a stranger passing by. It's like you, if you think and you realize that this is happening to somebody that's right in front of your face, whether you know them or not, you, there's no way you're going to feel secure. There's yeah. no way you're going to feel secure. I mean, there must be a sense of fear. I mean, there's a sense of shock here as well, just like looking at what's happening in America. Right. And I remember Trump was saying, oh, yes, London is like stab central and there's blood on the streets. And I thought, how can Trump talk about London, tiny mm -hmm. London, compared to America and all the, and the gun violence that's happening over there? Yeah. I mean, it's... When it, a couple of weeks, it was crazy. It was like every day, it seemed. It's every day, and the small ones don't even get covered anymore. They don't get any attention because, oh, well, it wasn't 50 people, so I guess it doesn't matter as much, you know? That's horrible. And even when it is 50 people, it's still not going to matter. Or does it seem used to? to it. We're getting used to hearing these stories, you know, in the news. Yeah, but people people just keep finding ways to justify it, and they just explain it away to themselves. And the people that say, well, you know, I don't support certain things he says, but I'm still going to vote for him because I like that policy about, you know, uh, the right to choose, for example. And they want to take women's right to choose because they don't like abortions. Yeah, um, they like the tax cuts as well, apparently. Yeah, Rich the tax really cuts. Happy. They're very happy, so, you know, it's about morality. It's about morality what in the end. What are you willing end. to trade off for and, a tax yeah. cut? What are you going to trade off? It's blood money, essentially, at this point. Exactly. exactly yeah. You know, you're not buying the blood diamonds from Africa anymore. or there, You know, there's, like, the fair trade stuff. Well, how, how do you bring up... Um, how do you translate that into morality, into some of these things that people should be caring about more than a buck? Yeah. It, yeah, I mean, it's really depressing. Yeah, it must be hard for you, like, you know, knowing all that's happening and your families are over there. Yeah. I mean, does your family ever talk about it, or...? No, I mean, I, I don't talk to my family that much. I, I mean, I do, but yeah. it's... I just think about it, and what am I going to say that's going to comfort anything? I mean, because the children that we're seeing crying in the streets, the eight-year-old girl, I mean, that could have been me as when I was eight. Um, my, my parents came to the U.S. illegally, and then thanks to Bush became legal and were able to bring us, but I could have just as easily been one of those kids or uh, one of the dreamers that are taken illegally, and then you grow up in this country and you don't really know what Mexico's like or even speak the language, and you're forced to go back. So, I mean, there's like thousands of, uh, they call them the dreamers, yes, um, that are in that limbo, and they're... I could have just as easily been one of those kids, except for, you know, Bush number one doing the amnesty and us being able to get into the U.S. legally, but, I mean... And it's really interesting to compare, I mean, when you consider the fact that Bush was Republican and yeah. Trump is supposed to be a Republican, just how diam diametrically opposed their positions are on immigration, immigration reform, and how to handle yeah. the immigrant situation. Yeah, and there's, and it's just a talking point in every issue. There's, they have their canned talking points, like, well, get in line. Well, there is no line for l legally doing this. There's no real line, but I, I mean, you can just, if if you're in that camp, you can just like, it's a throwaway. Well, they should have gotten in line. Like, th those kids should have been protected by their parents. You know, they or they wouldn't be crying in the streets if their parents hadn't broken the law. Uh, and what is, that still doesn't justify the cruelty. Is it amnesty? No. What is it? Asylum. Yeah. It doesn't even sound like there's a very solid. Uh, 
policy regarding asylum. And I'm someone who's from the States. I'm someone who tries to stay informed. And I don't always understand what the asylum policy is from week to week. If you just hear about the United States as some place that you can go to because you need to flee uh, whatever situation That's you're in. That's still legal. How are you supposed to make sense of what the asylum policy is until you find out at the border that it's not what you expected it to be? It's so perplexing. I mean, and I am someone who tries to stay informed, and yeah. it's still... It's like what happens to them is they end up being in some kind of legal loophole. You know, they're kind of used, and the whole story is used in order to back up um, politics, you know, to back mm. up the Republican... Pawns. Yeah, Political they're pawns. Just, exactly, just pawns. Yeah, and it's just the scary boogeyman of the week, essentially. And it's like you have a caravan coming to attack, and then that, yeah, you know, some of the words. That, that like, kind of um, the rhetoric is wrong. The rhetoric is wrong, and the rhetoric is inciting violence. And the rhetoric is nothing new. We heard this kind of stuff no, back in the middle of the 1900s. Well, we heard it in, so during the Nazis. That, <laughs> yeah, the Nazis, which isn't long ago. It's there's a pattern that works for a certain set of people and they're just rehashing it. And I wouldn't say that Trump was necessarily Republican. I think he just goes where the money is and yeah. the power. He's one of those type of guys. Yeah, no, I mean, no, I, I know a lot business. of Republicans who do not like Trump, but he's hijacked the party. Yeah. The whole mentality is hijacked the yes, party. Yes, it works for him. So, you know, it, it works for him and it works for the Republicans. But, yeah, but... Like we said, blood money, morality, all of that. But in, anyways, I mean, I think the topic can go on and on forever. Oh, that's so, And it just hits us like waves. We'll be in the middle of doing research. We'll be in the middle of reading an article yeah. and having a discussion. It's jarring. And then a headline will come in and another headline will come in. And it's just, it hits us in waves. And it's really, I mean, there's no way to compartmentalize it and just be okay with what's going on. It's like, we can't, we try not to become desensitized to it. We try not to just ignore it and like let it pass by. But there are so many elements that we're having to juggle at the same time. And it's just a matter of that. I think this podcast might reflect some of that on an ongoing basis. The difficulties of such harsh political climates, like um, just some really nasty things going on. But then having, you know, our own place and like culture and what we're trying to carve out and the, the dialogue and I don't know for me for like the past couple of weeks I've been trying to get at a perspective on things that um, might draw in a connection and I really like uh, that expression you're not part of the traffic you're not stuck you're not stuck in traffic you're a part of the traffic and if you look at something like actor network theory, network theory, we are not observing the problem, we are part of the problem, and we're going to either contribute to the solution or we're going to contribute to the, the momentum of it just getting worse. And I think that that's something that can almost be approached like on a, a molecular level of just how we approach, how our perspective on things, how we articulate, and the, when it comes down to like how we interact with each other, how we interact with strangers, common decency that we would show, uh, that we would almost take for granted at one point, but now making a show of, well, no, this is how we think people should be respectful towards each other. This is the way we think people should cooperate. And it's especially the people that you see as like the other, or, you know, other people might be calling them an infestation, but we don't see it that way, and we're going to make a point of not treating people like infestations. And if we can do that, then being a part of the solution and I think we see examples of people becoming part of the solutions when you see the the blockades that you see happening in the neighborhood so that the ice yeah. patrol can't get in at least for a while they they're presenting like obstacles and they're, they're presenting like different faces of resistance and we don't get carried away with uh, demonizing people who aren't like you, even if you don't see them. I mean, because again, it's something that we can do every day. Yeah. And I think for me, like the whole network theory um, makes me realize just how much a part of things we are. 
And so that's what I've been trying to like break down. And you know, this might get into what I've been doing for like the past couple of yeah, weeks. No, yeah, I, I uh, thought you had started. Oh <laughs> so. no, I, it's just because it really felt like a conundrum at first. How do we talk about fashion and pop culture when people are being thrown in cages and being separated from family? And I think that things are so mediatized right now. Things, so many stories are coming across for better and for worse. That if we're going to be contributing to media, if we're going to be interpreting media in any kind of way. We need to be clear on where we're coming from so that nothing can be misconstrued, but not beyond that, so that we can be an example of how we think things could go. Um, and so that helped yeah. me break down the conundrum of how do you talk about this and how do you talk about this thing? Because pop culture is not innocent. Pop culture is not happening in a vacuum. Pop culture touches the same people who are being thrown into cages. This, as, just as it does with us. Um, the people who are watching people being thrown into cages, the people who are voting against the other and you know heading down a really scary street, they're watching a lot of the same programs, they're hearing a lot of the same music, and I don't think it's registering. And it's not something that may be a conscious choice, but I, that's one of the, the goals that I've had for this, this past couple of weeks is, what does it come down to? And I think that a lot of it comes down to awareness. And I've really been focusing on journaling these past couple of weeks. Um, going through psychology texts, um, what are, you know, because I've wanted to start journaling, I wanted to um, really get my mind around the power of defining self narratives rather than just being bombarded with what everyone thinks. I should think is important and how I should prioritize meaning and like okay so I need to start wrapping my head around self-narrative I need to start defining it for myself not that I'm pretending to have complete you know autonomy and everything but at least I can start to examine the structures that are influencing my behavior and the way I think and the way I interpret the world around me so I started going through psychology texts. I started going through different sources, like what are good journaling questions that I can start asking myself every day that will help clarify things for myself. And um, that's what I've gotten down to. Um, and it's really interesting when you have to ask yourself every day, what's my agenda? What, what are some of my social narratives? And what are some neutral events that I've leveraged to create emotional responses for myself? And um, and then how can I turn that around and make it be of use for other people around me? And a lot of it seems like it's abstract, but when you have to do it every day and you have to articulate it, it stops becoming so abstract and it has really developed like a new space in my head for interpreting and um, just digesting what's going on around me and then seeing how I can participate. Um, yeah, so that gives a whole level of new meaning to the research that I do, the podcast that, it, um, this podcast that we're working on, um, the writing that I'm doing, different projects that I would eventually like to take on. But yeah, when you're being bombarded with so much. Um, I mean, that's real dedication. It's yeah. a real interesting project to kind of see. Yeah. Yeah. PhD. That's really interesting. But and I thought also into what actor network theory is it you call it? Yeah. Right. Yeah, that's interesting because it's true with all this new stuff that we're seeing about what's happening in America and here, all over the West, and even in Hong Kong as well. Yeah. Um, it is true that we see these things that are happening, and we are a part of it because we're watching children and thinking, oh God, that's terrible, isn't it? And then watching Netflix and kind of almost you block it out because truly what do we do how do we reconcile being not being part of that whole train of what's happening right right and when it's when you're watching a video whether it's news or netflix when does it become relevant when does it stop becoming entertainment and when it become relevant and how do you recognize the difference and I think especially for us when you take a look at the clothing that we buy or um, the, the food that we're eating the things that we do to take care of ourselves or to keep us comfortable or to expand our horizons 
that's especially when in a very material way it starts connecting with those with a lot of the cultures that are producing the things that we just kind of take for granted that we just buy and we consume and we toss away or we watch in the video it's like all of those things come from some place and often those places are being impacted by the very things that we're watching in the news and so yeah I mean that's like actor network theory I don't know if you know, it's not picking out one particular thing, but it is like an established connection between so much and fields within fields, connections within connections. Yeah, it's interesting because it, in it's in order for us to almost observe what's happening, we have to be part of that tree. Because if we didn't have TV or Twitter or you know social media websites we wouldn't be able to know what's happening in america or here so we are part of that whole train so how do you pick it apart and i think it's interesting you're saying yeah you need to be more i agree with you i think it's about being conscious about making conscious decisions consciously and a lot of people are indifferent or don't want to see it or don't choose to see it or say well it's not that bad or it's not happening when it actually is happening and it is that bad for some people in the world yeah and consciously i think people have to in the west they have to kind of look at what they have and work out what they actually need right and how much of what they need actually depends on these different cultures producing it for you exactly having a role in making it for you so serena what have you been up to this week so um been in London for the past week actually. I had a couple of meetings. I've been carrying on with uh, doing some articles. Uh, one of the meetings was interesting. Uh, it was about um, helping to revamp a website and to come up with like a brand vision. Um, so that was really interesting and it's interesting when you meet people and I've been doing a lot of these meetings and kind of showing what I can do and then they gauge what I, who I am and I'm gauging who they are. And I find that quite interesting because you've got the work, but really it's almost as if people are trying to find out if they can work with you, like mm -hmm. literally your personality, what kind of person you are. So is it easy to be truthful? Or have, is it tempting to like not be con No, because I'm a type of person where I'll just say. Yeah. But I don't know if, I, if it's me that gives, if I give that off to people. Oh, okay. That I'm mysterious in some way. I don't know. You I'm tell mysterious. me, am I mysterious? Am I hard? Am I hard not to crack? Am I? Do yeah, I, really? I would say you are. And okay. never. I, 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 I mean, you have a right to be however you want. And but like we told you, it was like to go to a museum with you, and how intimidating it is because you can spend so much time like just looking at things. And so it's like, well, her take on all. All that I'm seeing is so much more sophisticated than what, how I'm doing it because after a while my attention span goes out the window and I need to go get some coffee. Um, so that's one thing that we just didn't know about. Like, so and how many times have I been to a museum with you? Like, we've been to a museum yeah, a number of times, yeah, and it's have. only within the past few months did did I feel comfortable saying, "Oh." Well, you're a very serious museum goer, but not really knowing what's in your head. So that would be like maybe the definition of a tough nut to crack, because don't, I don't know what's in your head. Like when you're spending hours and hours having well, so much you, more patience. You, yeah, but are you interested? Is it like something you want to know or feel I should be divulging? I'm interested. Yeah. Do you think I should give more? Well, no, no, I don't want to say that for you because I've had people say that about me yeah. and that puts me on a course that I, after a while, it generates a sense of tension in me and it's like, no, I will give up what I'm ready to give up and, you know, take me as I am, take me as I am presenting myself to you and if you give me a chance, you'll see, like, what I can do, but I'm not going to, like, bend over backwards to prove myself to you in a way that seems foreign or alien and just not how I like to conduct myself. So I don't want to, I wouldn't want to do that to you. And it's like, what we get, it's like, no, I mean, it's like, that's, that's all we need. You want to give more, of course, because what we've gotten so far is like, yeah, but, you know, it's up to you. 
But yeah, you can be mysterious. Okay. Because like we'll ask you, like, how do you spend your day? Like, oh, you go to the library. It's like I would love to see what the library looks like, because then I would just get like a little glimpse more. And it's like, okay, well, where do you sit? Well, like, what do you read about when you're at the library? <laughs> like, and then we're like, oh, so does she have like a part-time job that like she spends doing things like at, at, until five o'clock? Or like, I wonder what her other like what is her social life like? Or because I mean. Sometimes we have no social life at all, and sometimes we do. So I'm like, oh, okay, so I wonder how it is with her. <laughs> so, but if, uh, I guess if we felt entitled to know that kind of stuff, we would just come out and ask. Mm-hmm. But no, it's like, just, it's up to you. How, I mean, how do you, what do you think, Rick? I don't know. I mean, I agree. But you are often a tough nut to crack, too. Like, you you just are. Like, well, I've yeah, I think actually speak louder. Least. And... And I, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't say some things because the action speaks for itself sometimes. So, I mean, if, if you want to say something or if you don't about what it is that you do, that's up to you. And I'm not going to grill anybody because I haven't... I mean, I like when people ask me about me. <laughs> but <laughs> I don't, you know... Have you felt like we weren't interested? Oh or? no, not at all. Oh, okay. Sometimes okay. I do, f- I do get that. Like I do. Yeah, maybe I'm a little bit um, cautious then, but I don't expect to like meet somebody and tell them my whole yeah. <laughs> because it's just not there in my head, or, yeah. or almost, and not in a rude way. But I don't expect to get the whole story from somebody else either. I think when you meet somebody, you form a relationship. You're on yeah. a journey t- together. Exactly. And however that pans out, then you take your time. But it's that choice of kind of spending time together, and. And also for me, even just with you, it's with you guys. It's um, it makes me feel more secure. Just kind of the way that we're getting on and taking time, and how you don't kind of have to delve too much. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And that we just kind of speak, and it's spontaneous, and we kind of find crazy things out. And it just feels like the relationship's going to go on. Yeah. No. Rather than I want, you know, I met this person, and it was like they wanted like a checklist. It's almost like they wanted everything around you to and be well, and have that be you. <laughs> it's like, but no. there's ways that you can do that where it's in you're interested in in non, not a judgment way checklist way. Because I'll tell you the everything in the kitchen and the kitchen sink. If we're having a good conversation, I can meet somebody and there it all is. Yeah, I'm from blah blah yeah, blah. Me too. Childhood this, childhood that, and I'm very trusting. Yeah, if, if I, it feels I haven't been right. screwed over very yeah. many times. So yeah, if it feels right, I'm the same. Like I've told you all times, just all kinds of things. Yeah. Like at uni, and you know, when you just at the right moment, yeah, it comes out. But yeah. but think- you feel it right away when it's not coming from a good place. Exactly. So if you feel that, wall up or cautious about what it is that you're... Yeah, because I'll be asking, I'll ask you, so what are you thinking? Like, I don't have to tell you what I'm thinking. <laughs> are you like that all the time? Oh, yeah, oh all the time. Goodness. I'm used to busy where sure, I... Right. <laughs> no, but my family's a lot like that. Oh, like, they're like, what are you thinking about? Oh, you know, I was thinking about this. You know, like, and I would just go into, like, what I was thinking oh, about. Okay. It's not like, I wasn't thinking about anything horrible. And if you really want to know, then, so, yeah, there are, like, six potted plants up there. And, yeah, that's what I was thinking about. Or I was like, oh, no, I was thinking I need to do this ethics approval form and all the interview questions. I'm just sitting there, maybe looking off into space. But if someone wants to ask me, I'm fine with it. But I'm so not- that's just a habit of not used to that about? you have that habit because your family has the habit my family does not <laughs> you don't do that no <laughs> I'm not at all. I've never heard of that before no, no. have no. you heard people ask what are you thinking about well, it even comes up in movies I'll be like see she asked him what are you thinking about oh this yeah right. but I'm, I'm also the kind of person that's like I'm, I'm how honest are people all the time? Like, are you really going to say what you're You'll thinking? Actually think and exactly. even if it is like you saying what you're thinking, people think a lot of garbage. 
like that yeah. isn't worth saying because it's like it was just a thought like your stream of consciousness if and I thoughts if I kill this person using a bucket rather it's just than a like, shovel it won't no, be as like, messy <laughs> sometimes I'll tell you what I'm That's thinking about when to. we're walking down Oxford Street and I'm thinking about somebody killing me like a bus or yeah, something like that yeah because he will share thoughts like that <laughs> <laughs> it's like, I don't want to walk next to the sidewalk because the buses are coming from behind and I know I'm going to end up in that pole. And you know, test me like, okay, so if you're going around this bus stop like this and there was an oncoming bus coming from this direction, what would you do? <laughs> like, or like, like what would you do if something ran me over? Like, I don't want you to look, first of all. <laughs> so, I was like, no, I but anyways, the it's kind of morbid. Video record mode and I would get it like no. details. Oh, but no. yeah, it is. Are we used to like ask if there was a zombie apocalypse okay and you Where were, were here and I was there <laughs> how are we going to meet and how are we going to get there I'm like okay we have so to you've work got it your out. contingency plan <laughs> oh we know how we're going to barricade this building oh so that nobody gets in <laughs> so those are the thoughts you're willing to share with me so I can just imagine what the thoughts are that you don't want to but share it's a lot of menial nothingness and no, I don't I see it as worth saying yeah, so that's why, like, I'm not used to that. I agree, because thoughts are ten a penny. It's people's... <laughs> yeah, are, yeah, it's, yeah. It's people's intention and engagement with you in the relationship, which is what I relate to. And I guess that's what I'm learning, like, the more people I express to or engage with. is It's not having that feeling where you think, this, why is this person asking me? It's just a natural... I just want to be in a situation where it's just natural and I feel comfortable to share you just always have, you always seem to have it together. And I mean, I know that no one has it all together yeah, like no. that, but I'm saying that it never got messy on the surface for you. Like, it was never messy. You never got messy. <laughs> you just never freaked out. Or... Well, you didn't either, do you, do you think? You, you didn't either. You seemed together the whole time, like, totally chilled and... Like, because I was like freaking out with the collaboration and the presentations. You're like, oh, I'm fine. It'll be fine. I don't care about the Oh, but I was lucky. I, was like, I got, well, I don't mind presentations, <laughs> and I got a yeah, good team to yeah, work with. Yeah, that's true. But, no, how you know I'm stressing out is when I'm sitting in front of a computer just staring at the screen all day, not getting up. And that's because I feel like I have no choice. Like, But you're like on stress mode all the time, anyways. Less so. Working all yeah, the time. See, he sees you differently, you see. Yeah. I mean, when you have to be pulled away because it, it might be just a different kind of stress. A stopping the point. The way that you do Are it. Are you really, like, strict with stopping points? Like, if you're in the middle of doing something and you have to stop, but you didn't finish the paragraph or you didn't finish the chapter, does it just bother you? <laughs> like, yeah, it, it does. And I'll carry on and carry on if it takes me, like, till 3, 4 o'clock in the morning or whatever. Yeah, that's how I get stressed. If there's like, I can't get to a stopping point, but I have to stop. But yeah, but you're you're diving to a sea of everything, and you can't do that. So he'll research for three weeks for a two thousand word essay that he'll write the night before it's due. Not that bad, but you research so much. And you have your mind maps and they all work because once you put it together, but before you put it together, it's just like, oh my God, you, you, you haven't written anything. You're still reading. <laughs> you have yeah. to stop at some point because right. you, there's just too much information out there. You'll never end. And it never will end. That's so true. And How do you juggle that? Overwhelming. I, I find that hard. I will research one topic and then it goes on and then I'll it, and it is like a spider web that just keeps going and going and going and I was doing that when I was researching yeah for my MA right. but I have to say doing like what I'm doing now article writing and doing the journalism stuff right it has made me because because you, you know an editor or somebody will say there was 700 mm -hmm. words or a thousand yeah and they want it and it's pretty like quick and that's what is the turnaround time like um, well, I had two weeks and I've done three articles and then she wants another one by next week. So you're turning 700 words around pretty frequently? Yeah, seven okay. to eight and then what was 900, it was a little bit over, but she said that was fine. Okay. You know, but 
but it's, it's really making me kind of strategize how I put these articles together, what's the most important. If, like, better than I did when I, I felt yeah. the MA, because with MA I was just going and going and mm-hmm. going. But because it's quite short, I'm having yeah. to, like, put it into the right order, make it snappy, make it quick, and make it meaningful. That's another yeah. thing I think I like to put into my work. So. Right. Right. Yeah. So it's it's like you put that. Yeah, you you kind of put that deadline on yourself. Right. Try to make it make sense as quick as possible. But you have to research it beforehand and take the pulp. Exactly. Than, you know all the bits on the outside. Use the pulp and use that. That that's how I've been getting through it. Is what's the most important information what's going to make sense quickest right to the reader okay yeah rather than kind of your own interests yeah you know how do i make it readable and accessible i think that's come out more for me this year in the research um because i went to a tutor um, and she works with dyspraxic and dyslexic students. She was like, just break it down into like little essays on one topic, on another topic, on another topic. And like, make it a few paragraphs. She said, don't bring all of your books to the cafe to write. She said, bring one book and you're whatever you're going to write with. She said, be nice to yourself. <laughs> like, don't make it so small and big and complicated. So, yeah, and I even refer to those uh, as essays now with Jane. I'm like, this is not literature view, it's an essay on this section. And that modernity and postmodernity thing was the biggest thing I've written for her, but otherwise it's been little slices that will eventually add up to sections within a literature And has that made view. it easier doing it like that? Oh, uh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah, I think it's made me a better writer. So that's what I'm trying to do. And I feel like writing in the journal, writing out my thoughts every day, and thinking in those kinds of terms, I, uh, it's just the practice of writing but in a way that's not just... Because that's one criticism that I got. Really abstract, really dense, really hard to follow. And my tutor said, you know, all of this makes sense, but if someone's phone rang in the middle of one of your sentences, they'd have to go back to the very top and start following it all the way through again. And like, is that how you want to write? And she's like, how hard is it to write like that? And I'm like, okay. So Yeah, no, no. You know, like, sometimes you'd send, you send me, like, really long texts, and I'm like, <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> yeah. But I must admit, when you write those, it, like, it makes sense. Like, it's thought out and put together, and it really does make sense. Right. That's how you should, to me, or I'm just saying to me, that's how things make sense. But sometimes I've read your academic stuff, and I've had to read it like, I'm still rereading this stuff, just to kind of... Okay. Yeah. Okay. You know, your stuff you did in, in, in oh the MA. Oh, my God. I, somebody asked for it, like, at the beginning of this year, because she was saying something, and I went back and looked at it, and I'm like, oh, no, I'm missing this thing, everybody. It's terrible. My ideas aren't really fully formed, and it just seems really patchy. Like, no, I just, oh, no, no, it wasn't terrible. I just felt like I wasn't understanding it. I'm like, oh, my gosh, it is so, te- it seems technical and academic. <laughs> yeah. What is he saying? What, how, you know, and it's so interesting what you write. It really is. Okay. But the, the... The text, the really long, like, text that you had to turn into a PDF because <laughs> it's so long. Oh, yeah. Like, no, but, like, they are so, like, what you say to me is so clear. Okay, okay. I'm and that to is that. valuable. Okay. We got off subject from what you, oh. your meanings and everything, which is fine, but well, well, have well, we left well, anything else? It's Can similar, we... really. Um, okay. So also, I mean, this is going to link into what we're going to talk about today, fashion okay. and mental health. Okay. Like, just being in London as well, just shopping and going to shops. And I went to, and I, when I visited my editor, I went to, um, after I've had my meeting with her, I went to Portobello Road. Mm-hmm. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. And I got really excited. How often do you go there? <laughs> well, when I come to London, I mean, I always want to go, so... So I don't even think of that as being in London. Really? I've only been once, and it seemed like it was really far away. You're joking. Am I, I mean, wrong? 
but no, but I yes, mean, we it's can. It's not in here. It's not we far. can walk there. Yeah, it's not far. Oh, it it's seemed like far. it was like a like a long way no, away. It doesn't no, no, feel no, like no. it's in London at all. No, it's a great place. Okay. And I remember going there when I was a kid with my uncle who used to live in Kensington and Chelsea, and we always used to go there, and I used to love it as a child. So it was just it's nice when I'm here and I can get to go and. The markets and the clothes, and the vintage clothing, and the vintage yeah. jewelry. I love all that stuff. We'll have to go sometime. Yeah. I know we keep adding to this list, but <laughs> I've only been once because I thought it was really far away. <laughs> so, yeah, no, I okay. recommend it. I think you'd both like it. If you like rummaging and shopping, do you like rummaging and shopping? I mean, I like seeing all the antiques. Yeah, That's what I like about Portobello. Of, yeah, it's but great. But then I can't buy any of <laughs> And I like shopping yeah, spaces. Price. I may not buy anything there, but I like shopping spaces to see like what people are selling, how they're selling it, what kind of, what do the customers look like, and just, just like all market. the all the old silver from the London families, <laughs> everything exactly. they used to own. Yeah. So yeah. it's all like that. Well, a lot of it is like yeah, that. The is. furniture and all of that, like you got like silver spoons or like little boxes and just. It's always the best place because the ri- the more rich people here than in probably any town. Yeah, in England, and you can, like, you get labels, and, you know, there's a lot of rich people mm-hmm. just give their stuff away, so, and then these shops will sell it for, like, 300 pounds, or 200, 150, and if you get some with marks on, you'll get it for even less than that, you know, and then you take it to the dry cleaners, and then you've got, like, a designer top, so. Uh, so did you find anything this recently? Yeah, I got um, a silk dress, a really nice silk dress. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, and a nice silk top. Oh, okay. So, yeah, real, like, 100% silk. So I've got to, like, get that dry clean as soon as I get back to Nottingham. Yeah. Take a picture of it and let's see what it looks like. Okay. Nice. I'll wear it to Paris, I think. Oh, good. There you ah, go. Nice. How, how soon is that coming up? It's next week? It's in the next... It's two, not long, is it? It's two like, weeks. Within the next two weeks. Next two weeks. Yeah, I'm heading to Versailles. Can't wait. It's birthday month for for both of you. Yes. <laughs> so, when is your birthday? It's just the seventh. The seventh, and mine is the fourth. So really close together. Yeah. Really, it's right around the corner. It is. It's not because yeah, it is literally next week. Is it? Is it next week? No, it's in two weeks. Two weeks, okay. And do you do, like, are you like a strict traditional birthday day person and you get a birthday week or a birthday month? Day, just a day, just a day. Okay, I'll have to work on that. <laughs> okay. It's been a birthday week for a while and he's trying to extend it to a month. I know, I heard you say a month. Yeah, I slide it in often enough and it just becomes reality. Oh. But you said that your trip to Portobello Road would connect with fashion and mental health, so... How does that like make the connection? Or are we gonna we're gonna talk? Yeah, it's a good segue into it, I guess. Yeah. For our next segment. Because because uh, shopping, I mean, uh, we touched on this before, but it does it kind of feeds your ego, and I think ego is an important thing to talk about. But when I uh, watch YouTube videos on mental health and self awareness, you know, the ego in some cases is. A negative thing because right. you're trying to feed it constantly like it's never ending it's like a monster that's always hungry mm-hmm. right you know and I go out and I buy things and it does this look oh no it doesn't look right and you know you can see people out here we're all out there like trying to especially just walking up Oxford Street a minute ago oh my god it's, it's so it's like they ego hoard. parade yeah honestly <laughs> it's a parade they like hoard to find something to make them feel better for whatever reason it's my favorite parade. Sorry, <laughs> it, but I love it. So that concludes part one of this week's podcast. Thank you for listening and stay tuned for part two. I'll be soon. Thank you for listening. We hope you enjoyed it. Make sure you subscribe to our podcast. We put it out weekly. And follow us on social media. We're on every platform. Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. We're everywhere.